Thank you all for joining me at the annual Naomi Power Kadar Memorial Lecture at Columbia University. I want to thank Jeremy Dauber, um, Agi um, Legun Legutko, Dana Kressel, Dina Mann, our caterers from, from Esprit Events, our photographer, videographer, the work study students here tonight, and everyone who worked hard to make this event happen. It's always uplifting to see a group of people come together and celebrate the historical, vibrant, and transformative nature of, of the Yiddish language and Jewish culture. But tonight, I am especially glad to be able to welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Jonathan Sarna. Jeremy Dau Dauber will introduce Professor Sarna and will give you a bi biography with, detailed, with details of Professor Sarna's extensive scholarship and accolades. But I want to humbly add that he was my professor at Brandeis University. He, he taught my American Jewish history class when I was getting my MA in Near Eastern and, and Jewish Studies. Um, I'll always remember Professor Sarna's passion for his subject and transferring that knowledge to his students. I am eager to become a student once again and learn from Professor Sarna this evening. My father, Dr. Avram Kadar, my sisters, Maya Kadar and Einat Kadar Kirecheli, who um, couldn't join us tonight because she's finishing med school, um, and, and myself make up the board of the Naomi Prower Kadar Foundation. My fam family and I started the Naomi Foundation to further my, my mother Naomi Prower Kadar's passion in the fields of innovative education um, and Yiddish and academic and scholarly settings. One of our goals of, as a foundation is to make a scholarship um, on Yiddish and Jewish topics accessible to a wider audience. We established this annual lecture to honor my mother, Naomi, as a scholar and a teacher. Our goal is to provide the opportunity for the public to explore topics in Yiddish language, linguistics, and history. My mother believed deeply in the transformative power of the, of the Yiddish language and saw the way Yiddish inspired her students to connect to their her heritage. This annual lecture very appropriately celebrates her love for Yiddish language and Jewish history. Naomi spent her life immersed in Yiddish. The daughter of survivors, she grew up speaking Yiddish in her home in the Bronx, and she and her siblings attended the Shalom Aleichem Folk Shul. In Naomi's eyes, however, you did not need to grow up speaking Yiddish um, to learn and appreciate all the art, history, humor, and tradition that the language has to offer. N Naomi taught um, Yiddish to students um, all over the world for over 25 years, and she took so much joy in helping her students uncover linguistic beauty and cultural richness of, of Yiddish. She later became a, scho um, a scholar of Yiddish and received her doctorate from this university where under Professor David Roskies, she completed a dissertation in Yiddish children's magazines in the United States from 1917 through 1950. This, dissert, um, this dissertation was published posthumously by Brandeis University Press under the auspices of Professor Sarna. The, the book is, is titled Raising Secular Jews, Yiddish Schools and Their Periodicals for American Children, 1917 to 1950. We have been partnering with Columbia University for several years um, now to bring this lecture and to support the Naomi F um, Fellowship, a study abroad trip of a lifetime where students spend the summer learning Yiddish at, tel um, at, the, Yiddish, um, at the Yiddish International um, Summer Program at Tel Aviv University and then travel to, po um, to Poland with, um, with Professor Agi Legutko um, for a tailored trip to explore Yiddish topics in Yiddish land itself. We are glad to, um, to have met several of the Yiddish students earlier tonight. We're proud of the work they are doing and cannot wait to see what they will accomplish. Again, thank you, Jeremy and Agi, for this evening and for their partnership. And I now call up Jeremy to introduce Professor Sarna. Nadav, thank you uh, for that beautiful introduction, which not only is so gracious uh, to all of us here at Columbia, who are honored to partner with you, with the foundation, with the family, uh, in sending Naomi's message 
uh, more broadly to the world, but also for the warm and wise words that you said about your mom, um, who is a very important part of the legacy of Yiddish education in the country in general, but certainly at Columbia University. Uh, I, when I arrived here, she was one of the people who was very instrumentally involved in Yiddish language education. And as you say, everything that you said about her is not only deeply true, but, but uh, touched a generation uh, of students who had the privilege of learning from her. And it is wonderful that her tradition of, of education combined with warmth and a familial uh, uh, approach uh, continues on uh, in this lecture uh, tonight. Um, tonight's speaker and I, a couple of minutes before we came over here to a delightful uh, dinner, I hope everyone had their fill, um, were talking among other things, among many other things, about Mishnah. Uh, and if one can excuse me for quoting something uh, in Hebrew in an event that is dedicated to Yiddish. Uh, I will try and inflect it with a Yiddish accent, however. Uh, it, the, it is said in, in Pirkei Ovis that the, uh, the, world, the world stands on three, three particular measures, uh, right? That of Torah, that of learning and scholarship, that of avoda, or avoda, that of service, and of gemilos chesed, right? Gemilot chesedim, of kindness and charity towards others. I would say that both the person in whose lecture uh, we are speaking tonight and the person who is giving this lecture tonight exemplify all of those <coughs> measures. Um, you have heard from Nadav about uh, Naomi better than I could express it. Uh, and it is my privilege not only to repeat and double that, but also to speak about that with reference to our speaker tonight. About Professor Jonathan Sarna's scholarship, scholarly record of scholarly contributions. He does not need me or anyone to discuss, and uh, I think you would rather hear the lecture than my given entire categorical list of them, because we would be here for a very long time if we did. Suffice it to say that he is, I think at last count, it is at least 30 books. Is that correct? Uh, here and there. Another, another five, another 10. Um, and uh, among uh, many of them, Lincoln and the Jews, General Grant and the Jews, uh, his magisterial work, American Judaism, a History, uh, won the, uh, Nation the Jewish Book Council's Jewish Book of the Year Award. And it is not merely a Jewish Book of the Year. It is one which helps us understand this topic for a generation and, and, and well beyond that. Um, and it is his scholarship in some ways that we are privileged to hear tonight. But it is also that scholarship which is tethered to avoda, to a, a life of service in the profession, in the community, uh, to the country, uh, and a kindness and charity that Nadav alluded to and that anyone who has had the privilege of interacting with Professor Sarna on a personal or a professional level understands is not merely uh, an obligation for him but is a birthright. Um, it is not only a deep honor to learn from Professor Sarna tonight, but it is a distinct pleasure to introduce him to speak uh, about uh, a figure who is now unknown, I think, to almost all of us, if not all of us, but will soon become part of our imaginations and our learning. This is not just Professor Sarna's gift as a speaker and a scholar, but it is also his great gift uh, as a studier, a student of the human condition. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sarna. Well, I'm, I'm awed. Thank you so much for that uh, gracious uh, introduction and uh, wonderful to uh, really see you again, Nadav, and uh, and others who are in the room. Um, and uh, I want to uh, really uh, thank uh, Professor Dauber uh, for inviting me and, and Dana Kressel for making all of the arrangements. I really um, feel a close tie to Naomi Prawark uh, Kedar because her book, which you've heard about, Raising Secular Jews, it's a study of Yiddish schools and their periodicals for American children. That 
volume uh, appeared, as you heard, in my series at Brandeis. Uh, it taught me a tremendous amount about the whole um, Yiddish Shula uh, in America, a subject uh, that is too little known and has, has really been neglected uh, until her book appeared. Uh, I gather that you can't all hear me. That's not a problem I usually have. Can we do anything about it? Can we make it louder? <laughs> Want to let people see me? Oh, it's not that that they don't care. Yeah, <laughs> they. Uh, um, uh, uh, this volume, which I recommend, opens up a whole literature by, for, and about young Jews who grew up between World War I and 1950, and even the photographs in the book are very well selected and highly important. Now, Naomi's raising secular Jews as well as most of the literature on uh, Yiddish culture in America, and for that matter, Jewish culture, focuses on the 20th century. And that makes sense. That's when most of America's Jews immigrated. It's when the great works of American Jewish literature, the canon that we know in English, in Yiddish, in Hebrew, in Ladino, all of them mostly are 20th century in vintage. But this evening, I want to take us back 50 years and talk about <coughs> the middle of the 19th century. And specifically, um, my topic uh, is a completely unknown. So don't feel guilty if you never heard of Cora Wilburn or her novel. Nobody's ever heard of it. Um, <laughs> completely unknown American Jewish novel entitled, titled, no, uh, that's Cora Wilburn, all right, uh, Casella Wayne, published um, uh, uh, serially in the spiritualist journal, The Banner of Light. This is, so far at least as I know, the very first novel written and published in English by an American Jewish woman, uh, and it actually revises the whole chronology of American Jewish literature, predating by a full third of a century, 32 years, what had previously been seen as the first Jewish novel by an American Jewish woman, a very different kind of book, Emma Wolfe's uh, novel of intermarriage, Other Things Being Equal, which was published in 1892. Actually, this novel precedes uh, and predates what Louis Harrop, uh, also a fine Yiddishist, described as the first novel of literary value to treat of American Jews seriously, realistically, and at length. Uh, that's Nathan Mayer's Civil War novel, Differences, published in 1867. Casella Wayne, set in the 1940s and published in 1860, just on the eve of the Civil War, predates Differences by seven years. But it's not just the early date of this novel that makes Casella Wayne significant. The novel, which is really an autobiographical novel set in the 1840s, opens up a whole world of which we know almost nothing. A world of crooked gem dealers who traveled to exotic places, Australia, India, Venezuela, 
visiting Jews in each one. A world where a Jewish child might be rescued from her non-Jewish father so that it might be raised by Jewish parents. A world where a Jewish father molested his daughter. A world where the daughter took solace in the new and heavily female movement known as spiritualism, becoming for a time among its best known writers. So the remarkable author of Casella Wayne, the very first American Jewish novelist of consequence, I see students here, there's tons of work to be done on Cora Wilburn. Uh, I have two huge notebooks of her work. Uh, this is only a forspice. Yeah, um, but uh, she published under the not very Jewish name Cora Wilburn, but her original name I discovered was Henrietta Pulfermacher. <laughs> yeah, you change your name too, yeah. A uh, Pulfermacher, for those uh, uh, who don't know, is powder maker. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think that uh, Naomi Prower Kedar would have resonated to her because Naomi, too, was interested in the story of young people coming of age. And as I discovered to my own great joy, and we'll share with you a little later, Henrietta, meaning Cora Wilburn, knew some Yiddish which she used to display her loyalty to the Jewish people and faith. Now, this coming fall, I am publishing an annotated edition uh, of Casella Wayne with the University of Alabama Press. This is really an extending ad for this book. Um, and there you'll be able to read my full introduction to this novel, as well as selections from Cora Wilburn's diary, which I likewise discovered. Um, tonight, owing to the constraints of time, my agenda is a little more modest. Uh, I want to introduce you to Cora Wilburn, recount my discovery of the novel and the diary, and conclude by asking why was Cora Wilburn for so long forgotten? So who was Cora Wilburn? She was born on December the 1st, 1824. She listed her birthplace at different times as either Germany or France, uh, and that means she most likely was born in Alsace which was either in Germany or France. Um, she was fluent in German with some knowledge of French, Spanish, and Yiddish, but she considered her mother tongue to be English. And it may well be that her birth mother was from England. That is certainly what she claims in the novel. Cora Wilburn's father, whom she absolutely despised and whose name she subsequently discarded, was an unscrupulous gem merchant and con man, as well as an abusive father and husband. He remarried following the untimely death of his first wife, but maintained his criminal ways. In 1837, the London Gazette listed him as an insolvent debtor and prisoner named Maas Pulfermacher. Six years later, you, can, you can't really read it, but six years later, papers in Burma and Sydney portrayed the same man as Moritz Pulfermacher, and under the headline, Tricks of a Traveler, it described how opulently attired 
in the company of his wife and daughter. He claimed to be a rich diamond merchant and swindled people by taking loans that he did not repay and by supplying them in pledge, false stones, counterfeit gold, and faux silver. At one point, he even had the chutzpah to impersonate Sir Moses Montefiore. Um, he also paraded as an American Jew named Moritz Jackson, and that's interesting because that is precisely the same last name that his daughter subsequently used when she immigrated to America. I'll show you a little later the ship's manifest. Even in an age when self-fashioning was something of a social norm, and Jews in particular changed their ways and their names, sometimes their noses, in quest of social and economic mobility, this case was extreme. Now, ultimately, Moritz, uh, that means her father, settled in the Venezuelan port of La Guerra near Caracas, where the Jackson family, as they now called themselves, took up residence in 1844. The surviving volume of Cora Wilburn's diary, written while she was still Henrietta, commenced in 1844. It begins on February the 28th, and it get painted a grim picture of her Jewish family, far different from the idealized Jewish family that so many 19th century Jewish writers and artists celebrated. Quote, I had not been home long yesterday, but it began anew. So she reported cryptically on March 1st, 1844. A week later, she explained that she and her father had again a most tremendous row, as usual for nothing. The brandy bottle was applied, and so began his cursing and bellowing. It continued till near morning. Within months, the situation at home deteriorated further. Her father, perhaps fearing that discovery of his crimes was near, turned violent. Yesterday, the looking glass was broken, she reported in May, and today, after 15 glasses were broken, he began to take a knife up to my stepmother, so we both left the house. Now, in uh, Casella Wayne, um, and there you see it where it appeared in the original, uh, in the banner of light, not a, not a journal that too many uh, Jewish historians read, uh, which is why um, uh, it hadn't been discovered. In Casella Wayne, Wilburn elaborated on the abuse that she suffered at the hands of her father through the voice of an alter ego, her central character, Casella Wayne, who bore her own initials. Yes, C. W. Cora Wilburn Casella Wayne. The novel described the threats, the screams, the assaults, and the beatings that Casella endured. The tension at home likewise took a physical toll on Casella's stepmother. Her health declined. She could no longer keep house. Finally, we know from the diary, on June 29, 1844, her stepmother, quote, departed this life for a better. God gave her a calm and peaceful end. Following this death, according to both the diary and the novel, conditions only became worse. Enraged that his daughter not only refused to assist him 
in his crimes, but also she spurned the much older man whom he selected to be her husband. Cora's father threatened her physically and drove her from the house. In 1845, Moritz Jackson, a Pulfermacher, died. Rumors abounded that he had been murdered. The orphaned Henrietta, as she still was then known, lost everything upon her father's death. Whatever of value he may have owned was stolen. My little fortune is irrevocably lost, she reported to her diary in anguish. Alas, I am doomed to misfortune. Her days as a gentlewoman, raised in a home with servants and the visible accoutrements of wealth, ended abruptly. She found herself practically penniless. Adrift in the world and taken in by sympathetic Catholic neighbors in Venezuela, Henrietta succumbed to pressure from those around her, and on June the 24th, 1846, converted to Catholicism. I had repented before it began, she subsequently admitted to her diary, but it was now too late. My word had been given. She attributed manifold misfortunes to this act of apostasy, describing it as an event that has called upon me the just anger of a most just God. Despairing of the fatal day, I changed my pure and holy religion for a false one, she vowed, 18 months later, to return, although alone, friendless, and penniless, to my religion, to my God. And here, to my great joy, is where she turned to Yiddish in her diary. The Yiddish students here shouldn't worry if they can't read it. First of all, the slide is hard to read. Um, but it's halting Western Yiddish, and she wrote it phonetically. If you look at line four, you'll see that umain sela are those two last words, not the way uh, you should write it on a Yiddish exam. Um, uh, and you can see I don't have every word uh, um, uh, there, um, uh, but uh, what she is doing is she's writing, dear father, lieber father von Yisrael, dear father of Israel, she is besieging God to save her and to enfold her again within his sacred love. She considered hers to be an almost unpardonable act of betrayal apostasy, like bastardy, was in her day a sin that one could never live down. Nevertheless, and I have to say more than some very recent scholars recognize, conversion could be a two-way street, permitting apostates to return home or here, as in the novel Casella Wayne, to seek out a kind of neutral in-between space where multiple faiths might harmoniously coexist. And in hopes of improving her situation and returning to her people, and buoyed by the traditional belief that fellow Jews would embrace and uplift one of their own, Henrietta Cora, spent $40 of her remaining funds and took to sea for a final time, hoping to make a fresh start as a Jew 
in Philadelphia about which she had read. She arrived in New York on September the 30th, 1848, reached Philadelphia that same night. Over the ensuing days, she bitterly recalled her faith in a Jewish moral economy based on mutual assistance was cruelly shattered. Went to the houses of my brethren, but was ill-received, alas, she reported sadly to her diary, Philadelphia's Jews only offered her menial labor. Now, until now, all of the descriptions of the female Jewish poor in Philadelphia, at least all those I know, have stemmed from the ladies bountiful who aided them. Uh, the famous example is the aristocratic philanthropist Rebecca Gratz. In Casella Wayne, Wilburn gave poor, uh, gave voice to the poor themselves, allowing us, I think for the first time, to see class relations among Jewish women in that city through the eyes of those who toiled to survive. And there really is a strong Jewish element that permeated her tale of woe. So, for example, uh, she tells one story in the novel about a Mrs. N.A. I suspect that that's Nathan, a big Philadelphia Jewish family. Mrs. N.A., a wealthy lady, one of the daughters of Israel, in whose Philadelphia home Casella sold for three weeks. Repeatedly, she writes, she was admonished to sew faster and told that girls that made their living must not talk of exercise and such things they had only to attend to their duties. Tormented by the family's rude, spoiled children, she looks forward with anticipation to concluding her job only to discover that the wealthy Mrs. Nay, N.A., has shortchanged her, paying her 25 cents less per week, that was real money then, uh, than originally agreed upon. When she gently points this out, she is ordered from the house. Her response, powerful and prophetic, reflects the lofty egalitarian values and unvarnished language that Cora Wilburn herself would consistently espouse. Quote, you may wrong the orphan and the stranger, but you will be none the richer, none the happier. Your religion is a sham. Your lives hypocrisy. I scorn. I shrink from association with such as you. <laughs> Not the way to make friends with the rich and uh, powerful of Philadelphia, but astonishing to see in such an early text. Jews in standard seamstress narratives, when they appeared at all, did so as wealthy male industrial capitalists who took financial advantage of unorganized women workers. Wilburn turned that trope upside down. Her central Jewish character, modeled as we've seen on herself, was poor, female, and an unfortunate victim of circumstance. Standard seamstress narratives also focused on the industrial arena, the factories, the mills. Wilburn focused on the domestic arena, the private homes where she herself had toiled. Finally, most seamstress narratives 
depicted needlework as a dead end, a life-defining fate. Will Burns' own story belied that. She, nevertheless, notwithstanding of the fact that she didn't remain a seamstress, she continued to champion those less fortunate than herself, giving voice to women who might otherwise have been invisible. After four years of mind-numbing toil, 1848 to 52, Henrietta broke free of her hated needle. Aided by Christian friends, she became a professional writer and began life anew. She would, from now onward, be known only by her nom de plume, Cora Wilburn, which soon became her legal name, listed in government censuses, and also on her death certificate. Like her father, who often took on new names, yeah, Pufferbacher and Jackson and so on, to hide from pursuers, she apparently hoped that by changing her name, she would change her fortune. Michonne. Shame, Michonne Mazal. As a writer, and it's worth remembering that writing was one of the few occupations that a woman of that time could take up with pride, as a writer, Cora Wilburn aligned herself for some 17 years, 1852 to 69, with the fast growing but highly controversial spiritualist movement which held that the spirits of the departed lived on in a distinct spirit world from which they continued to communicate with human beings. Nourished by the same upstate New York soil as the women's rights movement, spiritualists advocated women's rights and treated women on a par with men in their practices, policies, and ideology. Some of you will know Ann Browder's a great work on spiritualism and uh, the origins, really, of, uh, of the women's movement um, and, and so on. Now, Wilburn did not become a professional medium or a trance lecturer as the movement's most famous women did, uh, think Victoria Woodhull, who, by the way, was the first woman ever to run for president, uh, Cora Wilburn mostly reached people through her voluminous writings, and she published regularly in spiritualist magazines such as uh, The Banner of Light and The Agitator. Wilburn was one of a comparatively small number of Jews uh, in America who identified with spiritualism. She never denied her Jewish heritage. Indeed, in Casella Wayne, she celebrated that heritage. But much like Jews who would later participate in such movements as Unitarianism, ethical culture, Christian science, and more recently Buddhism, she insisted that her liberal spiritualist faith required her only to be true and pure and to live the life that is approved of God and angels. In a series boldly entitled My Religion, she went so far as to portray the human soul as a more reliable guide for human beings, even than the Bible. She also lived a very austere life, allowing no swine's flesh to pass her portals, using very seldom and very sparingly, this is all a quote, any animal food, living upon nutritious grains, plentiful vegetables, healthful fruits, avoiding stimulants, greasy foods and pies, barring from her home both alcohol and tobacco. Whether she would have smoked pot had she lived today or not, I don't know. 
Um, Will Burns' productivity during these years was astonishing. Serialized novels, lengthy translations from German and French, colorful short stories, pointed nonfiction essays, and hundreds and hundreds of poems flowed from her inexhaustible pen. As far as I can tell, no 19th century American Jewish woman wrote more. And these writings reveal Wilburn to have been a staunch advocate for social justice, a forgotten foremother of 20th century liberal Jewish activism. She spoke out boldly against African American slavery before and during uh, the Civil War. She's the only Jewish woman, I think, who actually published in William uh, Lloyd Garrison's uh, newspaper um, uh, on Garrison and the Jews. And where's my friend, Mrs. Rukames? Ms. Rukames, yeah, uh, her father wrote everything that's worth reading uh, on that subject, uh, but I would have loved to have shared with him this discovery about Cora Wilburn. He would have been fascinated. Um, and, um, uh, 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 in addition, as early as 1860, other forms of social injustice likewise drew from her sharp rebuke, quote, the hard-heartedness of landlords, the tasking of the wretched seamstress, the burdening of orphans and widows with the double weight of humiliation and toil, the contemptuous treatment of dependents, the starvation wages that force young women into the paths of degradation against all these outrages, my soul protests. Now, in 1868, Wilburn gathered funds sufficient to publish. Oh, that's not in the wrong place. Anyway, that's uh, that's her passenger list, but that's what I wanted to show you. Um, uh, to publish a small book of her poems entitled "The Spiritual Significance of Gems." She actually learned about gems in her father's house, but where he used the precious stones to profit and deceive, she looked upon them as spiritual preceptors, each imbuing its wearer with a moral lesson. Sapphire, trust in heaven. Diamond, spiritual purity. Chrysolite, holiness, and so on. The spiritual significance of gems, like most volumes of poetry, brought its author neither fame nor fortune. <laughs> but the volume was noticed by the American Israelite, that's the reformed Jewish newspaper founded by Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise of Cincinnati. He just turned 200 yesterday, so. Um, the reformed, uh, and, and significantly, and this is what interested me, the newspaper identified Wilburn as a Jew. Quote, the poems teem with kind and affectionate expressions and noble aspirations for the happiness of man, it reported, even as it grieved at Wilburn's belief, quote, in the dread superstitions of spiritualism. We are sorry, it wrote, to see so gifted a daughter of Zion being deluded by the heathen demonology of prostrating imposters. Yeah, Jewish week doesn't use that kind of English. Yeah. <laughs> Notwithstanding the spiritualist teachings reflected in her poems, Cora Wilburn, by the time this book appeared, had actually grown disenchanted with the spiritualist movement. Investigators, after all, had shown that the mysterious rapping sounds that once held believers like Wilburn in thrall were nothing more than noise produced 
by the vigorous cracking of toe joints. <laughs> that, that's the story of, a sp of, of uh, a spiritualist uh, rappings. Uh, other spiritualist demonstrations likewise turned out to be reproducible tricks rather than the manifestations of a spirit world beyond ordinary perception. Internal controversies likewise weakened the movement, particularly well-publicized battles concerning the issue of free love. Uh, so Cora Wilburn was scandalized by Victoria Woodhull's call for, quote, sexual freedom for all people, freedom for the monogamist to practice monogamy, for the varietist, that's a polyamorist, to be varietist still, for the promiscuous to remain promiscuous. Uh, really amazing uh, to realize those views were being debated uh, in uh, the 1860s. So it was that Wilburn left spiritualism and found her way back to Judaism. And you can follow this quote, urged by the strongest convictions of right and duty, I have returned to the faith I was born and educated in, namely the Jewish religion. This appeared in the Banner of Light on November the 13th, 1869, and she explained that she now identified with its progressive ranks, not its so-called orthodox standard, and that Reform Judaism accepted all enlightenment and welcomes every truth tending to exalt the material and the spiritual life of our aspiring humanity. She promised to continue to labor for the pure, the true, the beautiful, to the best of her humble cap capacities, but would henceforward do so as an identifying Jew. <coughs> and for the next 37 years, she lived a long life, living in the Boston area, she did identify as a Jew. She no longer produced much in the way of fiction or critical essays, Instead, the bulk of her writing consisted of poetry. She also became increasingly bitter and reclusive. Quote, Were I not bound by woman's fate that keeps me here inactive, two words, inactive, uh, while man grandly reaps, I would in Israel's sweet and holy name help to enkindle the world's freedom flame. So one of her poems exclaimed, her age, her sex, her ill health, her poverty, all precluded her from doing more to advance the great social causes that she cherished. Instead, she spent most of her time caring for beloved animals, that was her lifelong passion, reading widely, Reading, Jew writing Jewish-themed poetry. Thanks to a long letter that she sent to her friend, Rabbi Bernhard Felsenthal of Chicago, we know that she was supported by the Jewish community during her declining years. The banker Jacob Schiff sent her a monthly check of $10. The Hebrew Benevolent Society of Boston, headed by Jacob Heck, granted her $8 a month, which she took although she said she found it dreadful to be on the receiving end of public charity. She also received occasional commissions for poems, cared for beloved pets, and she assured Rabbi Felsenthal that she remained true to her faith. I observed the Shabbos, another Yiddish, conscientiously, the Pesach and the Holy Days. I keep Yom Kippur as would the most rigidly orthodox. Cora Wilburn died at home in Duxbury, Massachusetts on December the 4th, 1906. She had just turned 82.
too, all that careful living and eating apparently paid off, and in deference to her express wishes rooted in late 19th century environmental values, but in violation of Jewish law, she was cremated. Reputedly, she was the first person of Jewish faith ever cremated in Boston. Now, you may wonder, I didn't give you the footnotes, how did I discover all of this? Uh, the partial answer is I've been stalking uh, Cora Wilburn for years. Her name sits on several published lists of 19th century American Jewish women writers. Those are very short lists. So, uh, you know, unlike, I don't know, Emma Lazarus, everybody knows Cora Wilburn, who's she? And nobody knew anything about her. There's no listing for her in the Jewish Women's Archive. You can read the whole of the encyclopedic Jewish women in America. Won't find her name mentioned. I did find some of her poems in late, late 19th century Jewish periodicals like the Maccabean. Um, and, um, and I found an intriguing letter she wrote to the young Henrietta Zold, later, of course, the founder of Hadassah, extolling Zold's, quote, efforts in behalf of our unfortunate Jewish brethren in Russia. And then I read the early 20th century writer and immigration rights activist uh, Mary Anton's very sad account of her own visit to Cora Wilburn, quote, the most interesting woman I know in many respects. She found Cora Wilburn secluded in her old age. She had become, according to Anton, a hater of the world and individuals. And, and I found a few other obscure references to her, and I carefully uh, filed each one away. I encourage graduate students who come upon such people, make a file on each one. That's what I did. Then, a few years ago, I was invited to join a group at the Institute for Advanced Study in Jerusalem devoted to what was called Jewish women's cultural capital. That seemed like too good an opportunity to pass up, so I recklessly announced that I would see what I could find about Cora Wilburn. I dug out my file, and I recruited two Brandeis students to help me scour the internet for other references. Fortunately for me, Cora Wilburn is an unusual name. Yes, if her name had been Ruth Cohen, I wouldn't be giving this lecture. <laughs> what popped up astounded me. Hundreds and hundreds of pages of small print prose and poetry by Wilburn spread over a wide range of journals, most of them not Jewish at all, and extending over half a century. There's a lesson there for historians. There's a lot of Jewish history buried in general newspapers and periodicals. Um, I had no time to read all of the stuff we found, uh, so I assembled it all in two very large, loose-leaf notebooks. I dispatched it all uh, to Jerusalem. And there I sat day by day, beginning in September of 2016 at the Hebrew University, and I read Cora Wilburn's voluminous writings chronologically. And in due course, I reached her serialized novel, Casella Wayne, uh, which uh, I showed you this. These, uh, here it is, yeah, again. Uh, which began on the front page of the March 31, 1860 issue of the Banner of Light, a weekly journal of romance literature and journal uh, and general intelligence. The novel 
immediately captured my attention for its central characters were Jews. And it soon dawned on me that nothing resembling this novel exists in the rather meager canon of 19th century American Jewish fiction. It actually anticipates central themes of American Jewish writing later. Intermarriage, generational tension, family dysfunction, Jewish-Christian relations, immigration, poverty, the place of women in Jewish life, the rise of romantic love, and the tension between destiny and free will. The novel, in addition, provides thick descriptions of Jewish rituals, very interesting descriptions, of course, written for non-Jews, as well as fascinating uh, descriptions of Jewish communities around the world. She had traveled around the world, and some of them are almost unique uh, descriptions, such as India in the 1840s, of which we have very few descriptions. And, um, and the novel introduces readers to Jewish texts, little available at that time in English, such as the ethics of the fathers. That's why Professor Dalber quoted them. The standard work tells us that non-Jews only discovered the ethics of the fathers in the late 19th century when they were published as a book in translation, but much of the ethics of the fathers actually appears in this novel, and they actually appeared, contrary to what that article says, uh, in Isaac Leeser's prayer book, uh, from which Cora Wilburn uh, borrowed them. Um, the only full-length biographical article that I found concerning Cora Wilburn was actually published after her death in 1912, and it contained tantalizing quotations from a diary that Cora Wilburn kept. Well, I naturally wondered, might that diary survive? I searched in all the obvious places as well as some obscure ones, all without success. Then, uh, sometimes you get lucky in this business, but it helps to be prepared for that luck. I chanced upon a handwritten letter to uh, my teacher and in some ways mentor, the great historian Jacob Rader Marcus, founder of the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati. The letter uh, was written by Sadie Cohen, the widow of Judge A.K. Cohen. One or two people here will recognize that name because he was the judge in a famous case involving Rabbi Soloveitchik, who came out vindicated. Um, in any case, Sadie Cohen thanked uh, Jacob Rader Marcus for letting her know that the papers of the diary of Cora Wilburn have been received with the minutes of the Beth El Synagogue. Now, it will surprise, there are a lot of women here, it'll surprise you to know that the diaries of little-known women in the 1950s were not separately cataloged in most libraries, and that was true, and most archives, that was true at the American Jewish Archives as well. Essentially, women hadn't been invented yet at that time, and archives didn't... Uh, didn't list them separately. But uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Kevin Prophet, the archivist uh, then at the American Jewish Archives, based on the clue in this letter, which of course told him that he should look at the Beth El Synagogue, had nothing to do with the diary, nothing. But they were sent at the same time, he should look there. Um, and he had no trouble locating the long, overlooked item. Found it, he wrote to me in a gleeful email, and he soon sent me a scanned copy, that's the diary, uh, a scanned copy of the diary. 
And thanks to this diary, which covers the precise time period of the novel and was clearly its central source, I was able to fill in many blanks concerning Cora Wilburn, uh, in including much of the information that I shared with you this evening, and it helped me to distinguish what's in the novel, what's in the diary, uh, you know, what, what's imagined, and what exists. Now, you may wonder why, having now spoken for a long time, why was Cora Wilburn forgotten, given all that she wrote and did? Why have none of you ever heard of her? Um, and I think uh, we might learn something from a literary scholar named Ali Bechdad in his book, A Forgetful Nation. And he explains cultural forgetfulness as a form of ideological consolidation. Forgetfulness, he suggests, is convenient. It improves history by obliterating knowledge of the past that conflicts with messages that a country or a group seeks to project about itself in the present. Jews, I suspect, were very happy to forget Cora Wilburn's dysfunctional and abusive family. Better to think of life as with people. Uh, they certainly wanted to forget her conversion to Catholicism, her affinity for spiritualism, her revelations concerning Philadelphia's less than charitable Jewish elite, and even I think, much of her very strident social activism. The fact that she remained single, that she failed to involve herself in any real Jewish institution, and that she spoke out so stridently on behalf of the poor and the powerless did not help her memory either. American Jewish history has, I think, often been unkind to individuals who failed to live up to our community's shifting ideals. Subversives, the independent-minded, the transgressors, women in particular, have been banished from cultural memory. That, more than anything else, may account for the forgetting of Cora Wilburn. The time has now come, I think, to read and remember her. Thank you very much.